Okay, so good afternoon. So now Alex Jay is going to give his third lecture talking today on oscillations in matter. So thank you very much. That was li last slide from the previous lecture where I have shown uh, how things happen in a medium with constant density. Essentially, the dynamics of evolution is precisely the same as in vacuum. The only difference is that now you need to take parameters, namely the mixing angle and the phase of oscillations in matter. And I have shown the expressions before. So if it is just electron neutrino and two neutrino mixing, then you have two wave packets. And uh, uh, the distribution of color in each of the packets is determined by mixing angle and medium. And the size of the wave packets also determined by the mixing angle and medium according to a uh, new Hamiltonian, which takes into account also the matter effect. So you need to substitute in formulas which we have derived, uh, mixing angle by mixing angle and medium, which depends on density and on energy, which is very important, and also substitute the phase, which also depends now on density and uh, on uh, energy. So uh, I also discussed uh, the resonance case when the mixing in matter becomes maximal, and it corresponds to coincidence of eigenfrequency of medium, which is related to refraction lengths, and eigenfrequency of the system, which is given by the oscillation lengths in vacuum. So this is the resonance condition. And then we introduced um, the graphic representation. Oops some delay. So we introduced also uh, uh, the graphic representation of the oscillations and show the equivalence of the oscillations with spin precession of electron in magnetic field. And this is the case of maximal mixing when uh, the B vector, uh, uh, which determines the axis of the cone, uh, is along the uh, horizontal vertex. So the double mixing angle in medium is pi over 2. And so rotation occurs, rotation of the polarization vector of neutrino around the cone uh, with axis uh, given by vector b. So this is the case of constant density. And if, for instance, you started from this position, so you produce electron neutrino, because electron neutrino corresponds to vertical direction up, and uh, if the length of a matter uh, uh, layer is such that the phase is uh, um, pi over 2, then you will end up here. So you'll have maximal transition from electron flavor to muon flavor. If the, uh, the, the, la uh, the layer is, has a big length, then your vector, polarization vector, will rotate and make uh, many rotations. So what is the power of uh, uh, this graphic representation? And this you can see, probably we need to substitute, obviously. you need to see here. So suppose you have medium which consists of three layers with different densities. And this actually corresponds to realistic situation when neutrinos are propagating inside the Earth. Because in the first approximation, the Earth's density profile looks like here. This is the realistic density profile. Uh, and it consists of two layers. One is the mantle and then the core layer. And there is a sharp density change between the core and the mantle. So we have, roughly speaking, in the first approximation, such a type of profile. Then see how easy to see the evolution in this case. Suppose you start again with electron neutrino. This is point one, which corresponds to uh, uh, such a position. And then neutrino propagates in the first layer. So uh, that would be equivalent to precession of polarization vector at the surface of the cone with the axis uh, uh, which actually inclined by 2 theta m in mantle, right? Remember that uh, the B vector, it has uh, direction determined by mixing angle uh, 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 in matter multiplied by factor 2, okay? So uh, if layer would have uh, big lengths, then you would have just this type of the precession. 
And again, let me recall that projection onto this axis Z uh, minus so plus one half gives the probability to find the electron neutrino. But suppose the layer has a finite width and uh, neutrino arrives at the border between these two layers in the point two, and so it makes just this evolution, part of the rotation. And then in the point two, it enters the second layer. Now in the second layer, density is different. And therefore, the mixing angle in medium is different. And therefore, direction of B field is different. And suppose the direction of the axis or uh, the field B is this. So that now, starting from the point two, the polarization vector start to process around this new direction. So it start to process in this way, okay? Again, we have here finite size of the layer, and in the uh, point three, you make an evolution that it starts here and uh, end up in this position. Here in the point three, neutrino enters the third layer, and in the third layer, uh, the uh, density is the same in the first one, and therefore, again, the uh, cone will have the axis in, in the, this position. So that now the uh, uh, polarization vectors start to rotate again along the old direction, and so I will make the rotation here. And since, again, the size of the layer is finite, it may end up in the point four. So the total evolution will be like this. So you start here in this point one, then it go to this way, then to this way, and then to this way. So in such a case, you can get very strong transition, even if mixing angle is not maximal. So this is so-called parametric enhancement of oscillations. And here you see uh, the evolution change of the probability, transition of probability. So you build up big transition probability. This is in the first layer, this is in the second one, and this is in the third one. Although in each layer, the transition may not be very strong, and at the end of the day, you will have uh, almost maximal transformation. So this is another example, which is parametric enhancement of one, two mixing. This situation is also realized. This is realized inside the uh, Earth, but for different energy range. So it may be a more complicated motion, like you start here, then it, uh, in the first layer, the evolution is like this, in the second layer, evolution may be even like that. In the third layer, like this. So again, you end up with uh, almost maximal transition. And actually, you can cook some sophisticated density profiles to make different transitions. And one of, of examples is here. Suppose you create the density profile of this castle wall type. And then the evolution can be like this, like a spiral change of the direction of, uh, of polarization vector. <coughs> Questions? So this is so-called parametric enhancement of oscillation, another effect which is realized in nature and should be realized. I think there is no doubt that it should at some point. Yeah? Correctly. If I get it correctly, if we would be able to build an experiment with sandwich of different material density, that would be optimal to get to these results. So, for example, if we would shoot a beam through matter, so through rocks and then water and then rocks again, like intersecting a sea or something. Right. So uh, there are some, in principle, yes. So you can even have very small mixing, but due to many this type of the. Uh, parts of this period, quasi-periodic castle wall profile, you may produce big transition probability. In reality, I will show how it is realized in reality. So um, the oscillation length is quite big usually, and therefore you cannot use a, a small, like you're saying, okay, mountain and lake. And so. so the oscillation length typically in realistic experiments is comparable, say, with a part of the Earth's radius. And therefore, you need to have big structures to realize this. 
or you can go to very low energies. However, in this case, uh, it is difficult to realize such an experiment. However, one can think. So that, that may be an interesting point. Now, uh, suppose we have a varying density, smoothly and slowly varying density on the way of uh, neutrinos. Such a situation is realized in the case of uh, solar neutrinos and supernova neutrinos and also in the early universe. So there are many applications of, of such a situation. If the density changes with time or with distance, our Hamiltonians start to be dependent on time and the situation becomes more complicated. So we still have such an equation and uh, uh, nu f are the flavor states. Let us again consider two neutrinos mixing, and we can find uh, the eigenstates of Hamiltonian in medium. But now, since Hamiltonian changes in time, we can speak about instantaneous eigenstates. So to say we can diagonalize our Hamiltonian in a given moment of time and find these uh, uh, states, eigenstates of the Hamiltonian. In the next moment, because change, density changes, of course, the states will also change. Uh, flavor states are related to uh, the eigenstates of the Hamiltonian by mixing matrix in medium, and the angle now becomes also the function of time, right? Because it is function of density, density depends on time, and therefore mixing angle changes. Now let us find the question of motion for these eigenstates in medium. So for this, we take our original equation and substitute relation of uh, flavor states and eigenstates. And then we will get such a type of the equation. You see what happens in the contrast of the case with constant density. Hamiltonian is not diagonal. And there are off-diagonal terms which depend on the change of the dens of density and therefore mixing angle with time. So because of uh, time dependence of mixing angle, Hamiltonian is not in general diagonalized, right? So if you would have constant density, then here we would have zeros, and the only non-zero element is here, which actually uh, is realized in constant density case in a vacuum, when eigenstates diagonalize also evolution equation, so equation of, uh, of motion, not only Hamiltonian instantaneously, and then solution is trivial because then we just have uh, these eigenvalues and we solve trivial equation. So change of the density leads to appearance of off-diagonal terms, and therefore in this case we will have transitions between nu 1m and nu 2m, right? Because we have off-diagonal terms of Hamiltonian, which precisely describe transitions between uh, eigenstates. However, in many cases, these whole diagonal terms can be very small. They can be much smaller than this uh, diagonal term, and so such an inequality is realized. And therefore, in the first approximation, which we call adiabatic approximation, we can neglect these off diagonal terms, and therefore we are back to our standard usual previous situation of oscillations in uh, vacuum and in medium with constant density. So if we neglect uh, these off-diagonal terms, then eigenstates propagate independently as we discussed before, so like mass states in vacuum. So I have repeated this uh, equation again. So this is condition of adiabaticity. And uh, so the essence is that if this is satisfied, then I can neglect transitions between uh, eigenstates and medium. This means also that shape factors do not change. So remember, in evolution in a vacuum and in medium, we have this uh, 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 wave packets and shape factors didn't change. So the only what happened is the change of the phase. Okay. Uh, this condition is actually uh, very crucial in, uh, uh, in the resonance layer, where the mixing changes fast and level splitting is minimal. Uh, in this case, and if my vacuum mixing is not big, the, uh, this condition, adiabaticity condition, uh, uh, is reduced to this one, 
the size of the uh, resonance layer should be bigger than the oscillation length in resonance. So uh, what is this, uh, uh, the width of the resonance layer? It is given by such an expression. And actually, it's proportional to mixing angle. Remember, the smaller mixing angle, the narrower is resonance. And so uh, also, uh, the uh, density change with distance played a role. So if the density changes very fast, then uh, this condition is not satisfied. Because if density changes fast, then mixing angle ch changes fast, and therefore uh, you will have breaking of adiabaticity. And uh, this is oscillation length uh, in resonance, which is given by uh, oscillation length in vacuum over sine to theta. So you can extract all these results from formulas I have given last lecture. So what is the adiabatic evolution? In the case of adiabatic evolution, new 1m and new 2m do not interchange. So they do not transform one into another. And so the sizes of the wave packets, the, the amplitudes do not change, right? Because if they would have transition between each other, then the size of the wave packets or the amplitude would be changed, okay? But what changes is actually the flavor composition of eigenstates. Remember that mixing determines the flavor composition of eigenstate. Since mixing angle changes, then the flavor composition changes, which means these uh, red and blue parts in the course of propagation. So if you start with high density, then you may have such a configuration. You see here the biggest part is red, which means electron flavor. And the small one is, uh, is green one, muon flavor. But in the course of propagation, mixing angle ch changes, and therefore the flavor composition changes. And you may end up with this in vacuum. So suppose this is in the center of the sun, and then on the surface of the sun, you would have something like this. And you see, if in initial state, red flavor dominates, then here, green flavor would dominate. So this is uh, the adiabatic transformation. Of course, you would have also oscillation. You will have also oscillations. I haven't put here these oscillatory factors. So there are two effects. One is oscillatory behavior due to interference of different parts. And the second, and this is new degree of freedom which start to operate here, is the change of flavor of individual eigenstates. This change occurs in accordance to change of mixing angle, which uniquely depend on the density. Questions? See this picture. If you understand this, then, so we are done almost. You will understand all the phenomena related to neutrino propagation, essentially. Remember, in vacuum, these parts didn't change, right? So red and green in each of the wave packs, they were fixed. They were fixed by mixing angle. So essentially, this is determined again by cosine and sine, but now of mixing angles in a, a medium. OK? So uh, and now let me derive the formula which describes, for instance, uh, evolution of solar neutrinos. Extremely precise. So that will just be one slide, and I will derive formula which is valid with accuracy 10 to the minus 8. Even experimentalists are not doing it just, you know, blind uh, uh, computation. So they use this type of the formula. And it's very simple. It's valid for solar neutrino and supernova. So we have initial state. Suppose we have electron neutrino, like in the sun. And it is given in terms of eigenstates in initial moment, right? So neutrinos are produced in the center part of the sun. And so we need to compute the mixing angle in this initial point, in the production point. And then just by definition of the mixing in medium, electron neutrino can be written in this way. Again, in two neutrino case. Cosine 
theta m, and this is mixing angle in matter in initial point. This is nu 1 m. And sine theta, 0 m, nu 2 m. Agree? So this is mixing angle in matter in initial point. Now what is adiabatic evolution? Just following what I have explained before, this evolution, when neutrino trans moves from the central parts to the surface, and so potential changes from some big value to zero, what happens is that new 1m state just slowly transforms into new 1. And uh, uh, new 2m slowly transforms into new 2. Because new 1 and new 2 are eigenstates at low densities in vacuum. And since there is no transitions between new 1 and new 2, then the only what happens is that new 1 eventually transforms new 1m into new 1 and new 2m to new 2. Agree? Well, please ask me, because it's just a few lines more, and we are getting a result, which is, no, it's pitted if you, if you miss this. But you can repeat. This is nothing, nothing complicated. OK? Now, the final state, therefore, will be the following. I wanted to do this on the blackboard, but I don't think it's, uh, you will have any way in this slide. So what will be the final state? Mixing angles, so admixtures of this new uh, 1m and new 2m do not change. You know, these amplitudes do not change. And they are determined by mixing in initial moment, right? So you produce the state. Admixtures of new 1m and new 2m are determined by the mixing in initial state. And since there is no transitions between new 1m and new 2m, the amplitudes are the same. And again, determined by just mixing angle as in initial state. And the only difference between this and that is that now I have this new one and new two. And of course, the phase, some phase appears here. OK? So now we can compute the probability to find electron neutrinos. And I'm, for simplicity, just use expressions averaged over oscillations. Oh, now it's starting to work better. So what I will get is the following I need to compute this matrix element, so I need to take this state and uh, plug it with new E and compute moduli square. And what I will get is just this expression. So the first term just comes from this one, and then I take projection of new one onto new E, which is given by cosine theta, and I get this, and then I square this. And the second term comes from here, because I have this sine theta m, and then I project new to m onto new E. And this gives me this sine theta. And I square this. And there's, of course, intermediate term, which is just describes oscillations. And in this case, I just averaged out this term, which actually happens inside the sun. So that's it. This is the formula. And I can write this in, in different way or even in uh, some other way which you can use also. So this is the same formula. That's it. So this formula describes solar neutrino transformation, exactly, with accuracy 10 to the minus 8. The only one you should remember to derive it, that evolution is adiabatic. And this means that the, there is no transitions between eigenstates. So we neglect transitions between eigenstates, but we do not neglect change of the flavor of eigenstates. Actually, this is not a unique trans uh, situation. There are some phenomena of this type in atomic physics and optics in, in many cases. This type of approximation is valid. You neglect transitions between eigenstates, but you do not neglect change of the flavor of eigenstates. So you neglect some derivatives in your equations, roughly speaking, but do not neglect uh, the, the functional dependence. Questions? Yep. Um, I'm not sure I understand one thing. So, if I got it correctly, it looks like every neutrino sees the same transition in the potential from V to zero as if they were produced always in the same place. Uh, you would expect neutrinos to be produced in many positions in the sun and therefore transiting through 
very different potentials. But so sure. So actually, neutrinos are produced uh, not in one point. They are produced in some region, which is uh, for uh, for some boron neutrinos. It's quite small, point eight of solar radius. Uh, the density profile inside the sun actually is flattened when you go to lower energy, to, sorry, to central parts, it's like, like this. So this is exponential part. And neutrinos are produced somewhere here, but you are right. So you need to make averaging. This is for, uh, for neutrino produced in a given point, but eventually you need to make averaging over production region. Right. There was some other question there. Okay, good. So yeah, so this is for uh, probability for neutrino produced in a given point with a given density. But of course, neutrinos are produced in some region and there's some interval of densities and then you need to make this averaging. Good. So this is how this evolution looks like uh, when you study survival probability as a function of density. So what happens is that what the formula which I have shown you corresponds to this red, red line when I made the averaging over oscillations. And uh, so if you start far from resonance, this is resonance density, you start above the resonance density, then you have very small oscillations here and you end up in this way. If you would start close to resonance, then you will have bigger oscillations here. If you start very far from the central, if the density, initial density is very high, like in supernova case, you realize, then essentially uh, this uh, band be just degenerates in the line. And so the evolution becomes non-oscillatory, so just a smooth change of uh, the uh, flavor of a uh, whole state, which follows the change of the density. Okay. So this is the same in terms of eigenvalues. Remember, we had this picture, the resonance. These are uh, eigenstates as the function of density. And if you start at large uh, density somewhere here, so this is the resonance, uh, you are essentially sitting on one of these uh, uh, eigenstates. So uh, here you have electron line. So this is the energy of electron neutrino effective. And these are just uh, uh, these our eigen values. The fact that there is no transitions between these levels means that if you are sitting here, you will continuously sit down here. And evolution, when you go from large density to small, will be just smooth transition along this way, and you end up here. OK, so this is in terms of uh, eigen values. And let me make just one comment about adiabaticity violation. Actually, the nature is very kind to us. It seems that in all relevant cases, the evolution is adiabatic. But just for case, for instance, if you have some sterile neutrino with very small mixing, or you have shock waves propagating in, inside the supernova, and then in the shock wave, the density gradient changes is very big. And so you may have violation of adiabaticity in shock waves propagating in uh, and supernova. Uh, in this case, of course, you cannot neglect transitions be between new one and new two. And what will happen is the following. Suppose you start at, at this level, you are sitting here. But then, since density move, uh, changes quick, you, you are moving with fast uh, uh, velocity along this level. And there's a non-zero probability that you will jump from this level to that. It's like when you're driving the car, you didn't turn, you know, if it was high velocity, you may not turn appropriately. Uh, well, the same phenomenon, if you want, I mean, so that's physics is unique stuff. Again, so if density changes fast, then uh, you may have jump probability, and jump probability is given by such an expression, which is just ratio of, uh, uh, of the difference of the potential, or uh, difference of the, uh, between eigenvalues over the energy associated to this motion, which is kind of physically also clear. And uh, this energy uh, associated with this motion is just inverse of gradient of density change. There are more precise formulas which you can see here. Uh, now I will show you how these things look like using graphic representation. And the adiabatic conversion is 
this type of phenomena. So remember, if you just have constant density, then uh, the state it just processes around the surface, around uh, on the surface of the cone. But now mixing angle changes, which means that cone itself turns, and this angle is uh, two theta m. Density changes, mixing angle changes, and therefore the axis of the cone or magnetic field changes. Actually, the same phenomenon is also in, in the case of uh, precession of electrons uh, around magnetic fields. So if you change direction of magnetic field, then you can switch off uh, po po polarization of your electron, which will follow the change of the magnetic field. So you see here cones in different moments of time. Clear? And in this way, you may get a very strong transition if you start here, even if the cone angle is small, but because of rotation of the cone itself, you can transform your neut neutrino polarization vector from this direction to this one. So you may have very strong transition, flavor transition in this case. The size of the cone angle doesn't change. So you see the cone is here, and this reflects the fact that there is no transition between uh, eigenstates. So if adiabaticity is uh, violated, then the situation is like this. So not only the axis of the cone changes, but also this, uh, uh, the size of this uh, cone, so rotation angle changes, it, it increases. And that reflects transitions between eigenstates. Okay, so you see here, another degree of freedom becomes operative. Not only the phase change, which describes rotation of the polarization vector on the cone surface, but also the axis of the cone changes. So this is just summary which tells you what is the difference of the oscillations and this adiabatic conversion. In the case of oscillations, this degree of freedom is operating, the phase as the function of time. And uh, the mixing angle doesn't change, but it is function of energy in the case of uh, oscillations in matter. For adiabatic conversion, in the case of non-uniform medium, we have this another degree of freedom, mixing angle which changes with time. This is dynamical variable now. And this is finally uh, how it looks like. So suppose you have uh, the layer with constant density and you saw already this picture. Uh, then in this case, you will have the following distortion of energy spectrum. So the ratio of uh, uh, the spectrum at the detection point over the uh, original spectrum will be like this. Uh, 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 periodic or quasi-periodic function. It will have oscillatory behavior. In the case of uh, smoothly changing density and uh, after averaging over oscillations, you will have the following dependence of energy, of uh, probability, uh, essentially this is the probability, uh, uh, the function of energy. So just smooth change. And this is uh, the size of this probability is just sine squared theta. You saw this in one of the formulas uh, for adiabatic transformation. Yeah? Wait, 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 wait. So you talked about the adiabatic conversion, and we, saw, we also saw the density profile of the Earth. Um, maybe this is related to the previous question, but that, does, that looked like quite a big jump at that point. Um, does that also lead to these um, uh, oscillations between the, the matter eigenstates, or is that because oscillation length is too long not really relevant in this scenario? So, uh, in the case of the Earth, we had kind of the system of layers with quasi-constant density. It's, there is no adiabatic transformation here. Or Transformation is adiabatic within the layers. But then at uh, the border of the layers, the density changes so quickly that it is just uh, you know, maximal violation of adiabaticity, of course. And of course, this means that at this point, the eigenstates change completely suddenly. So you had one system of eigenstates, but then they change immediately. So 
that's uh, what happens. Thank you. So now you know everything about neutrino propagation, almost. I will skip this conclusion, and there's a kind of list of the papers, uh, original Wolfenstein, and so our papers with Mikheyev. And actually, this this is 30 years from the, uh, my first presentation of MSW effect, which is this adiabatic conversion. And it was in Savon Lina, just uh, it was a conference from 16 to 22 of, of June, and it was the, first, uh, the first, first presentation of this paper. Now phenomenology, and I will discuss fluxes, detection, and the results. So let me tell you what I'm, going, what I'm going to do. Of course, it is not possible to cover all the experiments, all the results. So I will just try to give you the flavor about the most important experiments essentially running now. And uh, so what, are, what is the outcome? And uh, uh, tomorrow I will discuss some future, so what we are expecting uh, in the coming years. So I will start from solar neutrinos. And here you see uh, the flux of solar neutrinos. The energy range is from zero to, say, 14 MeVs. So solar neutrino spectrum is in this low energy range up to, say, actually 18 GeVs. There's also HEP neutrino. You see here several different components like proton-proton neutrinos or PP neutrino, which, is, uh, which are neutrinos which actually appear from the first reaction inside the sun when two protons create neutron and then uh, electron, uh, uh, positron and electron neutrino. So there are two main chains of nuclear reactions inside the sun, uh, and eventually they lead to transformation of four protons to helium-4. So in the sun we have burning of uh, hydrogen and creation of uh, helium core inside. And there are several reactions, and the chains of reactions, which produce this uh, complicated spectrum. Again, this PP is the biggest one. Then we have beryllium neutrinos. These are neutrinos which are produced due to capture of electrons, and therefore you have the line. Uh, then there is this uh, famous uh, boron neutrino, which was first detected. Uh, and there's also PEP line. And uh, here I don't see, but there are some also other uh, uh, components which are from CNO cycle, which is kind of subleading cycle of nuclear reactions inside the sun. You see here also uh, the list of different experiments and uh, their sensitivity range. So for instance, super K and SNO are sensitive only to this high energy part. So they essentially detect boron neutrinos. Chlorine experiment, this is historical first experiment that covers bigger range of energies and also it's sensitive to beryllium neutrino. Now gallium experiments, they are sensitive even to bigger energy range and uh, boroxina also can detect very low energy neutrinos. So what happens with solar neutrinos? They are produced in the central part of the sun. They adiabatically propagate inside the sun and they undergo conversion, which I have described just uh, few slides before. I, coherence here is lost already inside the sun, so which means that uh, uh, you have no already interference effects, and you can understand this in terms of this separation of the wave packets, which I have discussed. Then these neutrinos, nothing happens on the way from the sun uh, to the Earth, apart from the fact that the flux just decreased like one over R square. And then what happens inside the Earth when neutrinos and they are arriving as mass eigenstates, nu1 and nu2, these states start to oscillate again inside the, sun, inside the Earth, because in the Earth we have matter, and therefore the eigenstates in matter are something different. nu1m, nu2m, and let me put here Earth, Earth, and this also splits, and therefore we will have oscillations between nu1 and nu2. So interesting that in matter, mass states oscillate, not flavors, mass states oscillate. And that also affects the fluxes which you are detecting here. Now these are pictures of some experiments. These are historical experiments. Home stake, which uses this process to detect solar neutrinos. Uh, and uh, 
two gallium experiments, SAGE and GALEX, and then it was GNO, which uses this reaction of uh, uh, electron neutrino uh, captured by gallium uh, 31. These experiments no, uh, do not run, so this is the famous Davis experiment, uh, but uh, still some results kind of affect us, and not only on solar neutrinos. Gallium experiments made so-called calibration of the detector. So, so to say, they put source inside the detector just to see if they understand correctly the detector, if cross-sections are correct. And what they have found, something strange. So they have found that the signal is smaller than they expected. So they know source because they prepared some radiative elements quite, uh, quite big, with big radioactivity, and it was chromium and argon put inside so they knew what is activity. They could even measure by uh, heat release. So what is the, the power of the sources? And then they saw some signal which is below what is expected. Something like by 20%, 15-20%. The difference is not statistically very significant, but all experiments, both experiments saw this deficit. And now what we call this, we call this uh, gallium anomaly. I will discuss this next uh, lecture. And one of the explanation if, is that there are some other neutrino species involved, sterile neutrinos. And this kind of small uh, 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 value of the flux is because electron neutrinos or electron antineutrinos produced by source partly were oscillating into sterile neutrino. And there is an, a number of new experiments which will start uh, uh, soon to check this. Now, these are experiments kind of more recent. Super Kamiakanda is still running, so they study scattering on the electrons. And this is a huge water Cherenkov detector. What you see here is uh, this is huge detector filled in by water, and this is something like 50 kiloton of water uh, tank, and at the surface you see photomultiplier, so they see what happens inside the, and inside the volume. And uh, if neutrino interacts, so it actually uh, knocks electron, so electron moves quickly, produces Cherenkov light, and this Cherenkov light is detected uh, at the surface of the detector by these uh, photomultipliers. Now, SNO result, and this is still running experiments, so I will show you some recent results from this experiment. SNO, a Sudbury Neutrino Observatory, uses heavy water, and they managed to detect three types of reactions. One is this charge current, so this is heavy water, uh, therefore this is D2O, uh, uh, so that's uh, deuterium. Yeah? Sorry, I cannot hear you. Um, how does super K distinguish between muon and electron neutrinos? Uh, no. But electron neutrinos have a, a bigger contribution because it's due to charge current. And uh, so muon neutrino and tau neutrino also produce effects. So you need to take into account this. But is there any effect in the Cherenkov light that comes off from uh, the differences? No, because it's from electron. If electron has the same energy, then uh, it produces the same Cherenkov light. So you do not detect neutrinos themselves. So you detect recoil electron. So the important process here was this famous neutral current process. You have neutrino just which splits deuterium, neutron, proton, and this neutrino. And this is because this uh, uh, reaction is actually uh, is produced by all neutrino species, so muon and tau, and it doesn't affect its rate by oscillations. Neutral currents are the same for electron, muon, and tau neutrino. Okay. And therefore, this reaction is not affected by oscillations. This one, this is due to charge current. This reaction is affected. And also, this uh, uh, neutral current, this process is also affected by uh, neutral currents and all other reactions, uh, and oscillations also. Comparing the rate of this charge current and neutral reaction, you can immediately realize if there is some leakage of electron neutrinos. And that was the first real proof which doesn't depend on solar neutrino models that we deal here with some flavor transitions. Now, but 
Actually, decisive experiment was not even solar neutrino experiment to resolve the solar neutrino problem. It was a Kamland. And Kamland is uh, this big scintillator detector. You see a man here staying, so I just, uh, everywhere here you can see what is the size. And this is scintillator, something like one kiloton of scintillator. Also view it by uh, photomultipliers attached at the surface of this volume. So they detected this uh, classical inverse beta decay reaction uh, in the first reactor experiment. And neutrinos were taken from atomic reactors. So atomic reactors produce huge fluxes of electron antineutrinos. And they detected these neutrinos not just from the closest reactor, but from many, from all the reactors in Japan and even in uh, South Korea. So uh, the idea is to have big distance from the detector uh, to the sources. And remember, the process is actually uh, characterized by oscillation lengths. And the oscillation lengths is, let me give you uh, a an, an numerical expression so that you can. So this oscillation length can be estimated as 10 to the 3 kilometers, 1 GeV, um, energy over 1 GeV, and delta M square over 2.5 10 to the minus 3 electron volt squared. So if you have neutrinos with energy 1 GeV and delta M square equal 2.5 10 to the minus 3, then the oscillation length is 10 to the 3 kilometers. So this is the biggest mass split, but the smallest mass split, which is actually operating in the case of solar neutrinos, is something like 30 times small, uh, bigger. So, so, sorry, split is smaller, but oscillation length is, uh, is bigger. So this is for 1, 2. So this is, say, 1, 3 due to the bigger mass split. And this is for 1, 2 will be given by 3, 10 to the uh, 4 kilometers. So this number instead of uh, 10 to the 3. Now, reactor neutrinos are low energy neutrinos. This helps. And uh, so you need to take here not one GeV, but something which is, say, uh, at least two orders of magnitude smaller. And then you get, in the case of solar neutrinos, you need to divide this by, say, factor of uh, three, three ten to the two. And what you will get is something like 100, right? So then it will give you 100 kilometers. That will be the oscillation length of reactor antineutrinos with energy, say, three MeVs. And luckily, super K was in the play, and also this Kamlan, because this is also in the same place in uh, Kamioka mine, was roughly at the distance, in average, 180 kilometers. That was average distance to uh, atomic reactors. And so uh, they can measure delta M squares which are relevant for solar neutrinos. I will show you in a minute what actually the present day situation. So what they observe is the following. So that's uh, dependence of survival probability on the L over E. So this combination enters the oscillation phase, right? So you can change L, you can change E, and they manage also to uh, extract not only energy dependence, which is easy, you just detect uh, your events and measure the air, construct energy of your events. But also you can have some sensitivity to L because some reactors were switched off for some period, some not, and so uh, this also effective distance also changed. And they saw this very nice oscillatory picture. And they managed to measure with high accuracy mass square difference, delta M square. Uh, uh, with worse uh, sensitivity to mixing angle, but mass square difference was measured very nice. Questions? Yeah? Can they point the direction of the neutrinos? Oh, no. So, unfortunately, no, because this is, you know, neutrinos have lower energies. There's very little sensitivity to, direction, uh, to, to the direction, because you need to go to higher energy, so comparable with proton mass to have, because the energy of neutrino is uh, 
comparable, uh, is much smaller than the mass of the proton. So the scattering, although not completely isotropic, but then you have also events from different sides. And uh, so they didn't use this. Yeah, so another question there. So this is the best fit point using also three neutrino oscillations. You see how it, the data are described. Um, I'm sorry, but I really to understand the meaning of this oscillatory hmm? result. I mean, so what we are having here, the, the length or of the, the neutrino what is traveling, or, or I, I just don't get it, sorry. Okay, so um, what you see here is uh, essentially the change of, when you change, so let, let me do the following. So suppose you have the same distance. Suppose all your uh, reactors are the same distance, 180. Then you change energy. So when you move from here to there, so you change the energy. So here is the highest energy, then you reduce energy because uh, uh, it's uh, in denominator. The phase of oscillations, remember the phase of oscillations. Well, let me just write probably uh, this picture. Um, so if I put here energy, not inverse energy, then what I would expect here is the following. I would expect such dependence of probability, survival probability. This is what matters here at the function. Oh, sorry. So it's, no, no, no. Better, better to do in this way. So 1 over E. Then I would expect this. This is because the phase of oscillations is given to 2 uh, 4 pi energy and over delta M squared. Now, this is the period of oscillations, and this is the depth of oscillations, which is given by uh, sine squared to theta. So the formula, remember, it was 1 minus sine squared to theta sine squared f over, over 2. And uh, so I'm wrong here because it should be opposite, right? <laughs> so it's a delta m squared over two energies. So and L. So this is how phase is determined. So again, let me repeat. This is the phase. And here is one half of this phase. And it is uh, inversely proportional to energy, right? If L is fixed, then it's, uh, so this is just, uh, like here, like, like this function. And the depth of oscillation is given by sine squared to theta. And this is precisely what you see here. Of course, one needs to take into account also the averaging effect, partial averaging effect, efficiencies. Uh, and so this is nothing but, but this type, part of this oscillatory curve. And from the depths, you, do, you extract mixing angle. And from the period, you extract what is delta m squared. Yeah. Yeah, uh, so how do you cal uh, experimentally evaluate survival probability? I mean, what is the initial flux of the neutrinos? That's how do you know? And as you said, the, the detector is not sensitive to the detection. So uh, for, uh, how can you be sure that what is the length that the neutrino has, been, has traveled? I mean, where has it produced? Right. So what you need to do, uh, you need to compute number of observable effects. So you know what is the probability. You need to take this probability. You need to make computation of the effect from each individual reactor, taking into account that they are at different distances. Fortunately, for the most power reactors, and kind of those who contribute a lot, they are we're quite close to, to the detector. So if you would have kind of complete averaging over distance, of course, you would not see oscillatory picture. Now, of course, you need also to know the flux. And in this experiment, they just use some uh, uh, computed flux of, uh, of electron anti neutrinos. In the modern experiment, so in, in the present day experiments, they have some kind of other control. There are some uncertainties in this, of course. 
the uncertainties in the flux. Now people say that this is maybe up to 6, 10% even uncertainty in the flux. You can extract the flux from the power of reactor because there is kind of good relation between power of reactor or the heat released and the flux of neutrinos. Okay. So, uh, but to extract, for instance, uh, delta M square, no need to know this absolute normalization of flux. So this kind of analysis doesn't depend much on normalization of the flux because you extract a period from here, but by changing just up, down, you do not change period here, right? So delta M square can be extracted uh, very nicely. And actually, this experiment gives the best measurement of delta M square to one, one of these mass square differences, just because of this nice uh, uh, description of the of this uh, periodic. Less sensitivity to mixing angle, which is also affected, uh, which is affected by, by normalization uncertainties. Yeah. Uh, yeah, actually my main question was that actually the length, I mean, the length that the neutrino travels. Suppose you, you have a point at say uh, 50 kilometer per yeah. MeV. Uh, how do you know that I have to put the point there in 50 Again, kilometer? Again, what I'm saying to you, I, I, I reply to your answer because I, <laughs> You, you, this, is, this is observable curve, which means that this, for instance, blue line, it takes into account already result of summation overall. Of course, you cannot distinguish. Being at uh, Kamioka mind, you cannot distinguish if this a given neutrino came from reactor at 100 kilometers or 500 kilometers or 300 kilometers. So what you are doing is just doing computation of total flux of these neutrinos, taking into account different distances from, just summing up. And fortunately, this summation doesn't lead to a complete averaging. Uh, on the ground of neutrino, individual neutrino detection, of course, you cannot say anything. So you detect many neutrinos, taking into account all the distances, all the different spectra, even different reactors give slightly different spectra. And then you get this uh, green part. And then you confront it with uh, uh, experimental observations, as usual. OK, thanks. Um, I have a, a very small question. Isn't this reaction producing a lot of energy? If this reaction, what? Isn't this reaction producing a lot of energy? Uh, which one? So the this one, one if you have this one, uh, yes. You see, neutron is slightly heavier than, than, than proton, and so the energy which you are producing here is uh, the energy of neutrino minus, uh, what is this, two, two MeVs or so. So the energy spectrum of reactor neutrinos is from, say, zero up to eight, ten MeVs. Okay, so, uh, so it doesn't overshine the Cherenkov radiation because it's some, I mean, it's small explosion essentially. Oh, it, it produces Cherenkov radiation, of course. So these detectors actually they have kind of uh, they can detect both Cherenkov light and uh, they can detect also scintillator shining. So they they since they are not uh, interested in direction, so they cannot detect direction. What is important for them uh, is to detect. Uh, uh, all the energy released from a given reaction. Okay, so uh, now solar neutrino date. Last year, two very important events happened. One is that uh, finally Super K announced, say, that they see a three sigma level Earth matter effect, a symmetry of the signal between day and night. And this is what I have explained. This is because of these oscillations of mass states which arrive at the surface of the Earth inside the Earth. And you see here dependence of this. Uh, uh, so here is dependence on the zenith angle. The biggest effect, of course, uh, uh, for, for neutrinos which are coming exactly from down to up, right? And the effect is about, say, 4%. So 3, 4%, 3, 4% is what, what is asymmetry. You see, now we are kind of really in the phase of precision measurements. Also, I should say that there are kind of big fluctuations of the points. You see, there's some point here. This is what is, uh, what is actually predicted. This is blue. And this is the best fit point. And this is asymmetry when you sum up the signal over night and over day. So this is the difference. And this is average. Okay? 
There's also energy dependence. So one expects that uh, the effect should increase with energy. It, it somehow increases, but uh, also some fluctuations are here. And now there is some puzzle. And this is one of the puzzles in, in neutrino physics. And so some experiments are actually keen to check this. The first of all, uh, the day-night asymmetry, which uh, 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 is observed, is somehow bigger. The effect is something like two sigma bigger than what is expected if you take delta m square according to Kamland result, which is the most precise measurements of delta m square. And you see uh, here, so these are experimental data, and you see this in average, something like the effect is, uh, say, 3%. Now, if you take uh, the data from Kamland, so this is the range of delta m squares determined by Kamland experiment, then you uh, should see something like less than 2% day-night asymmetry. So this is kind of a bit puzzling. And then I will show you some other things which might probably puzzle with you. The second important event last year uh, is detection of PP neutrinos. So this is proton-proton neutrinos from the first reaction uh, inside the sun. So proton-proton reaction. And the Boraxin experiment managed to do some, some wonderful things. So they dig up the effect of these proton-proton neutrinos uh, from big background. For, for instance, here you see some other things. So you need actually to extract from the data this, this type of the flux. So Boraxin experiment measures neutrino electron scattering, neutrino electron scattering at very low energy. So this is key EV uh, range energy. So the release is very small. Uh, and uh, so they, they manage. So you see here the energy in key EV, something like 100, 200 key EVs. And uh, so that's uh, because of very high uh, purity of, uh, of this experiment. And uh, here you see this experimental point. Uh, in the plot, when I show this uh, probability of new E to new E transition, and this is what is expected according to adiabatic conversion, which I have explained to you before, and you see data nicely uh, are lying on, on what is expected. Now, this is some more global result, which uh, we put here are all the experimental points from different experiments. This is from Boraxino. This is also Boraxino measured beryllium neutrinos. PEP neutrino, and there's uh, many points. Uh, these uh, dashed are, again, from Boraxina, but what are important here are some points which have very small error bars, like this from SNO, and also su from Super Kamiakande. They're measuring very precisely this high energy tail of solar neutrino spectrum. And uh, here there's something in, first of all, let me, let me say the following. Here at higher energies, matter effect dominates, so that's Essentially, these lines are converging to sine squared theta, uh, which was in our formula. Here at lower energies, this is so-called vacuum-dominated regime. This line uh, actually uh, converged to just averaged vacuum oscillation result. Because here delta m square is bigger, and delta m square over energy is much bigger than the potential. So uh, in fact, uh, these regimes, they are, when you compare delta m square, over two energy, so this is vacuum contribution with uh, V potential, so versus V. So if this guy is bigger than the potential, maximal, say, inside the sun, then we say this is vacuum dominating regime. And in fact, the results of oscillations are close to what you get without any matter effect. That's clear. Now, if this is much smaller than V, and this happens when energy is big, then it's matter-dominated regime. And you see there's kind of intermediate range, which is not covered by experimental results, and we expect this upturn. And now there's another puzzle, that this upturn hasn't been observed in no one experiment yet. And you see, for, for instance, uh, SNOC even turned down of the spectrum. Also, super K see some kind of uh, reduction. So it's not clear what happens here. That's one of the, one of the uh, important goals in neutrino physics to, to test what, at least in solar neutrino physics, to test what happens in, in this intermediate range. So we are expecting some new physics at LHC. It may happen that new physics may appear here. So there are several explanations possible of this. And actually also the same 
Probably this fact is related also to this uh, day and night asymmetry bigger than is expected. That may be due to so-called non-standard interactions. So maybe on the top of our usual interactions, there are some additional non-standard interactions. So they may produce such an effect. Another possibility, if some new neutrino states exist. I don't know if I have taken uh, this plot. No, no, maybe. No, I have not taken. So uh, here you see two curves. One is from best fit point of just solar neutrino data. And this is OK. But blue one is just going by far from these points. So this blue one corresponds to delta m square from, from uh, Kamland data. So it's not clear. Maybe, come, maybe something is wrong with Kamland data. And actually, recently, we have realized that the fluxes of antineutrinos we used before are somehow wrong. So it is realized recently that uh, there are some certain bumps which haven't been observed, uh, uh, taken into account before. So the situation is a bit messy. So you don't know where is actually, uh, what is the reason of this type of the, uh, of the discrepancy. Actually, I, I tried this with Maltoni, and the result is kind of unexpected because we tried to implement these new determinations of the flux of antineutrinos from reactors, and we have found that discrepancy even increases. So this is one of the hot topics now, nowadays. Now people start to recalculate and measure again the fluxes of antineutrinos from, from atomic reactors. It's old subject. You know that Rhinos have discovered neutrinos using atomic reactors. And now we have this puzzle with atomic reactors. So uh, if you introduce non-standard interactions, then these lines can be just, uh, changed by some, something like that. And if uh, additional sterile neutrinos are introduced, new neutrino species, that may be even like that, so something like that. So it's interesting to watch what will happen. So in many cases in, in the past, these anomalies appeared and disappeared. So, so but anyway, it's interesting to see the developments. Uh, here probably I will show you such a plot. And this is determination of one, two mixing and delta m square one, two. And let, let us see just this plot. So what you see here, the, the region, allowed region of parameters, mixing angles, as you see this one, two mixing is not small, it's something like 0.3, and delta m square, which is uh, around four, or maybe 4.5, so this is the best fit point from solar neutrino analysis only. And you see what Kamland is giving. The Kamland is here. It's something like two sigma from here. But it seems that uh, this uh, new update of the spectrum may even move this upper. So this is the present day situation. Not only this, you can use uh, data to extract the potential, matter potential. And here what we did, we, we are not the first, that if you try to extract the potential from the data, considering it as free parameter. So actually, Wolfenstein make these computations, and it looks like it's just standard physics, and it's, this is just square root of 2 multiplied by Fermi coupling constant and density. This is, looks standard. But if you extract this from data, you will get something like 1.5 times bigger. So another puzzle, probably related to others. Uh, here what you see, the problems and future. So what I mentioned already, absence of upturn, large day and night asymmetry, difference of uh, delta m squares, large value of the potential, and we don't know what is this uh, another reactor anomaly, or maybe something happens with solar neutrinos. So what is future? Future, we want to detect this SNO neutrinos. So these are components which have not yet been detected solar neutrino components. It's difficult because, not because they are very small, because they are in very dirty region, because there are many backgrounds in this. So this is one important problem, because that may clarify some astrophysical issues related to, uh, uh, to the sun. Then uh, we need to make some more precise measurements of PP and beryllium neutrino fluxes in this way to have further tests of uh, uh, all this type of evolution. And it's interesting to make detailed study of the Earth's matter effect. Even tomography of the Earth can be done. So let me finish and then you will ask. And what are future experiments? Super cable continue to operate and SNO plus 
who will start to operate soon. And these are a remote future, more remote. So it's that Juno experiment uh, can also detect solar neutrinos, hopefully. But it will start in 2020. And uh, that's even more remote, maybe 2025. This is the biggest version of Super-K. This is Hyper-K experiment. Yeah. Again, I'm interested to, to know um, the, when, when they see uh, neutrinos, find, when they see signals from neutrinos inside, say, super-K or hyper-K, how do they differentiate whether it's coming from a, a PP process or a BE or SNO? Okay, so super-K doesn't see, super-K has quite high thresholds, so they just see uh, boron neutrinos only, so there's no problem with super-K and SNO, they have higher threshold. Now, in low energy range, the situation is like this. Um, so, Borexino experiment, and uh, there were some, well, let me probably go back to, uh, so that, no, that's one. So, you see, uh, that is the signal which is uh, due to P, P neutrino. This is, due to, this is due to beryllium neutrino, so that's typical uh, spectrum of elect recoil electrons you are expect. So you see, you can distinguish just using, uh, uh, say for instance, this range, because uh, PP neutrinos are not contributing here to measure beryllium neutrino and use then this range to, to, to measure PP neutrino flux. So they're separated in energy. So that's uh, more, uh, there are some energies where the contribution of one of the components is dominant. Also, is there some spectral flux that they fit to see whether in the recoil energy of the electron you see a, a, a certain shape that gives you the, the shape of a beryllium to neutrino? To some or? extent, yes. You see the shape is different here and there. But, uh, yeah, so you can also, they, they are using also the shape. But you see, you see not the shape of the spectrum itself. Uh, they see recoil spectrum. But, of right. course, if you have beryllium line, which is original line, Still, you, for electrons, you will have kind of wide distribution. For PP, already original flux is kind of wide. It's not just line. And therefore, you see not uh, like a peak here, but some situations. Yes. And I assume that the shape would be different for atmospheric neutrinos, right? Oh, yes. So here you can right. compute what is the contribution of atmospheric neutrinos. Of course, they did this. And it, for these energies, it's small. So let me ask you, I, I, yeah. Uh, by the discovery of the earth matter effect, uh, what do you think about the determination of the delta M atmospheric square? Sorry, to the determination of what? Delta M atmospheric square. Oh, I, that's next topic, actually. I, I, I started from solar neutrinos. And actually, sometimes this delta M square 1, 2, and uh, theta 1, 2 are called solar mixing angle, solar delta M square. So. And I want to ask you, I can probably spend five minutes because there were some questions. Uh, 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 no? <laughs> no, you are, uh, sorry, you are not, yeah, I should. So can I spend five minutes more because uh, we had some questions? Uh, just to move, uh, probably just this and then I will finish. So I, we are moving to some. Uh, to talk. Then I will, I'm going to discuss atmospheric neutrinos, uh, accelerator, and reactor experiments. So that's uh, uh, the plan for, for, for next slides. Uh, so this is what we have inside the Earth. We have a uh, 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 mantle, we have uh, the core, inner core, and even some layers here. So the Earth looks like a you know, multi-layer system. Uh, and then applications, and actually all these neutrino fluxes, almost all we are discussing, they are somehow propagating inside the Earth in one way or another. So that should be taken into account. Sometimes it produces very interesting effects. Uh, applications, so here we can discuss flavor to flavor transitions and this takes place for accelerator neutrinos, for atmospheric neutrinos and for cosmic neutrinos. So what happens is that neutrinos of certain flavor, for instance muon neutrinos, enter the Earth and somehow oscillate and then we see the result. And we also can discuss mass to flavor transition. This is what happens with solar neutrinos and supernova. So this is uh, uh, the, the density profile. Uh, so if you have questions, I can answer. And this is what you expect for oscillation probability. So this is 
the probability of nu e go to nu mu, or nu mu go to nu e if you want, as the function of energy in the range, say, from 0.1 uh, GeV up to, these are not solar energies, they have higher energies, up to 10 GeVs. And these are probabilities for different directions. So this is for vertical direction, when neutrinos are coming from down, exactly. And you see what happens here. There's a big uh, depth of oscillations, which are due to enhancement of one two mixing. So this is one two uh, resonance. Then uh, probabilities decrease. And then there's another thing here. And uh, these peaks are due to this parametric enhancement of oscillations, because for these vertical directions, neutrinos cross both the mantle and the core of the Earth. These two plots correspond to uh, different cosine theta. This is my, uh, this point 0.8, which is some kind of incline, and uh, this is for point 0.4. So that corresponds to trajectories which do not cross the core. And here you see again two resonances, two regions of resonance enhancement. Here, around 0.1 GeV, and here, around 6 GeV. Remember this number. We will discuss this later. So, the two resonances due to two delta m squares. One is small, solar, which I have discussed. Another one is big one. So this is what you are expecting. Now, different colors correspond to different CP violating phase. Uh, I will come to this a bit later. Now, this is for nu mu to nu mu. And you see what's going on here. So again, this region and this are affected by this resonance phenomena. So this one and this. But in the bigger, bigger range, here we have just something which is very close to vacuum oscillations. And to some extent, we were lucky because the first analysis have been done for just a two neutrino case uh, without any matter effect. And to a large extent, we were right because in some big ranges of energies, in fact, the oscillatory pattern is close to what you expect for vacuum oscillations. And this is uh, in the three neutrino, sorry, this is in the plane energy and uh, zenith angle. So uh, these colors give you the strengths of the size of the probability. One is, so uh, this black is probability is one. And this is for transition of nu e to the sum of nu mu and nu tau fluxes. Nice pattern. So this is the image of the Earth, actually, in neutrino light, if you want. And so what you see in this, picture is the following. This corresponds to vertical direction when neutrinos go down from, from sorry, from, from down to up. This is horizontal direction when neutrinos come from horizons. And uh, now you see different structures. This is due to MSW resonance peak uh, due to one, two mass square difference. And it corresponds to different phases. This is parametric resonance. This actually point corresponds to one of these geometric pictures I have shown you before. Um, now what else? Now this is the resonance peak due to one two mass splitting, which is the biggest one. Uh, and uh, so these are parametric ridges uh, which correspond to one three frequency to bigger mass square difference. Before I ask question, so this is for neutrinos and antineutrinos. You have this picture in the case of so-called normal mass ordering. I will discuss this later. And this is for antineutrinos. There is no resonance here. You see a big difference. Actually, if you switch hierarchy of masses, so you have one, two states down, which are small, have small splitting and one isolated. But if you turn the picture, then essentially you need to turn uh, this, uh, these patterns. Okay. And so I will start from this next lecture. So thank you. <laughs>